So we're going to be in John chapter 15 in a few moments. Before we get there, uh, I want to share with you, I read a, a fascinating book recently by this title, Lost Connections, Why You're Depressed and How to Find Hope. Uh, some of you might uh, be interested enough to pick it up, but it's written by a guy named uh, Johan Hari, and um, it, it's all about uh, kind of exploring the causes behind anxiety and depression. But what I found most intriguing about the book is the statement that he makes early on. He says this, anxiety and depression are only the sharpest edges of a spear that has been thrust into almost everyone in our culture. So if you get the premise, what he's arguing is that, uh, yes, there are some people who suffer from clinically diagnosed anxiety and depression. But what he's saying is that even those of us who are not uh, clinically diagnosable with anxiety and depression are familiar with the signs and symptoms and causes of anxiety and depression. And it's not a stretch at all to make the claim that that's pretty close to a universal experience. And so you're not clinically depressed and anxious about what's going on in this week ahead or in this week you just passed, but you're familiar, right, with the twinges of anxiety and depression that can sometimes hinder us from, from living and flourishing in life. The book, um, he kind of uses this metaphor of uh, connection as the root cause. And so he kind of unpacks in the book uh, our lost connections with people, with uh, purpose, with nature, with meaningful work. And that's kind of the, the, the metaphor that, or the, the image that he unpacks throughout. And the, the author is self-professed atheist. And so in the second half of the book, when he gets to offering some solutions to this, all the causes for anxiety and depression, I, I just, I'm going to tell you, if you pick it up, a lot of good stuff in the book, but the solutions section made me feel like, really, that's all you got? Like, that, that's our best solution, because it was very technique-driven, very tools and techniques-driven. Um, and one, one of the sections he was talking about reconnecting with meaningful values. And in this section, he had this to say, um, he was interviewing somebody and he was saying to the interviewer, he says, like, we all need to form and take part in a kind of Alcoholics Anonymous for junk values, a space where we can all meet to challenge the depression generating ideas we've been taught and learn instead to listen to our intrinsic values. And he says, we need to create a counter rhythm a counter rhythm to overcome our depression generating disconnection. And so I'm reading this book and I actually, there was a big section of margin at the bottom of the book. It was the end of a paragraph. And this is what I wrote in the book. I said, it's called the church. <laughs> a counter rhythm to the junk values and the disconnection that is running rampant in our culture that is causing us to experience increased, even, I mean, you could say it's normal. It's more normal for you to be anxious and depressed than it is for you not to be in our culture today. It's to that point. He uses the word epidemic to describe it in the book. It's common. And uh, really unwittingly in this book, as I'm reading it, this self-professed atheist as I'm reading the whole book, particularly in the solutions section, he unwittingly makes a very compelling case for why the world is desperate for the church to be the church. He wouldn't offer it as a solution because he can't go there as a self-professed atheist, but he makes a very strong argument for what we've been talking about in these weeks, and particularly today as we talk about how the world is desperate for life-giving, deep relational connections. The world is desperate for it. And I, I'll be honest, I have become more aware of this the older I have gotten. I'm 43 if you're wondering, and I'm feeling much older all the time. Uh, I'm just going to tell you. I was talking at our Discover class that's meeting right now, and uh, I said something like, I've been in ministry over 20 years, and I kind of caught myself like, oh my goodness, 
How'd that happen? Anyway, sorry, just confessional therapy here, all right? Um, anyway, so uh, I realize in my journey that uh, when it comes to experiencing deep life-giving connections, my experience is the exception rather than the norm. Um, I have so many deep relational connections that, that go back some to junior high and high school, but many that are like right now. And, and I, I've grown up thinking that's normal. Um, one of my, my closest friends, his birthday is today. My wife is surprised I even remember because I'm not good with birth dates. But we go back to like he was 11 and I was 12 when we met. And we're still very, very close, deep friends. But even in relationships with our staff and team and others that I'm in community with in this community, um, I, I thought that was normal. To have the kind of relationships where you can be completely yourself, where you can confide in others, where you can be fully known and still loved and cared for, where you have a list of people that if you're going through a rough time, you could call them at any hour of the day and they would be there for you. And I'll, I'll just confess that I've come to recognize that that's not typical for a lot of people. I encounter a lot of people, um, especially men, but, but women too, in their 40s and 50s that uh, are experiencing deep relational connections with others for the first time in their lives in their 40s and 50s. And I've come to realize that that's more normal than, than not. And there's some of you sitting here today that you, you have friends or family, but when I'm talking about deep, life-giving connections with other people, if you're being really honest with yourself, you're not sure sitting there today that you have that in your life now or ever have. That's the reality for some of us in the room today. And yet, what we're going to look at in Scripture, what I think uh, an atheist unpacks in his book for us, is that we're created for this. We are created to be deeply connected in relationship with other human beings. We're created for connection with God, but equally significant, we are created for connection with other people. And so when we don't have those kind of deep life-giving connections, um, we don't flourish. We're not, we're not living our best lives apart from those kind of deep life-giving connections. And here's what I would offer to you today, that the church is God's plan A to offer all people deep life-giving relational connections. This, this is God's plan A. The people of Jesus filled with his presence, embodying his presence and activity in the world. The church is God's plan A to offer that. And I'll tell you uh, kind of autobiographically that I think the reason, the, the primary reason I've grown up thinking that it's normal to have deep life-giving relational connections is that my life has been rooted in the church. And only by the grace of Jesus, my church experiences have ruined me for superficial relationships. Uh, I understand that's not true for all people who have grown up in the church. But my church experiences have given me all of these deep relationships that have made a difference in my journey. And I think that's my, my journey is a glimpse of what God intends for the church. Not that I've lived it perfectly, but the church has offered this gift to me of deep, life-giving relational connections. And we're going we're gonna to explore a little bit about what that depth looks like today as we look at this passage of Scripture. We're going to be in John chapter 15. And so we were in John 15 in the first eight verses a few weeks back talking about this union with God in Jesus, that Jesus is the vine and we're the branches and that our, our connection with Jesus is, is so deep and intimate that you can't tell the vine from the branch. There's a oneness in relationship with God and Jesus. And so we're going to pick up in verse 9 and read a little bit more in John 15. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation today. 
my aunt tipped me off to this version, and uh, if you've never read it, uh, it's worth reading. It's, it's, uh, it's a translation, not a paraphrase, but it's been giving me kind of a fresh, fresh perspective on some very familiar passage of Scripture. So this is the Passion Translation, John 15, starting in verse 9. I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands. For I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. So this is my command. Love each other deeply as I have loved, as much as I have loved you. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. You show that you are my intimate friends when you obey all that I command you. I have never called you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants and servants don't always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my most intimate friends for I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father. You didn't choose me, but I've chosen and commissioned you to go into the world to bear fruit. And your fruit will last because whatever you ask of my father for my sake, he will give it to you. So this is my parting command. Love one another deeply. So there's the big idea again, that deep life-giving connections are rooted in relationship with Jesus and defined by selfless love. We're longing for this. We're created for it. And these kind of life-giving connections are rooted in Jesus and defined by selfless love. When we uh, looked at this passage a couple of weeks ago, we, we unpacked this a little bit more, but the, the life that we're all searching for is a life that is found in being connected to Jesus. We, we flourish when the life of God through the vine is flowing through our veins as branches. This is the life that we are created for. And when we are living connected to Jesus, we're uh, abiding in him, his life flows in us and through us. And so what happens when we're experiencing the fullness of life in Jesus is that it expands our capacity to live in love with other people. So I'm receiving from Jesus life and love. And so when I interact with Vince, guess what flows out of me? It's the life and love of Jesus flowing in and through me in my relationships with others. And the two are tied together. And so it's why we're back in John 15 again. You can't talk about our intimate connection with one another apart from this intimate connection with Jesus, this life-giving union with him. But when we are connected to him, then it causes us to be able to live in love with other people differently. And it makes sense if you just kind of unpack it for a moment. If, if I'm connected to Jesus and I'm experiencing God and Jesus meeting all of my deepest needs then I am more free to love other people that I'm interacting with. And so if, if I am free from the fear of rejection and failure, because um, did, you, did you listen to the lyrics we sang a few minutes ago? Uh, one of them jumped out at me. It was something along the lines of um, living in God's love, and it said, uh, what more could I want? Or what more could I ask for? Something like that. I'm misquoting a little bit. And as I sang it, I thought, oh, a lot right? What more could I want? Well, I could want the love of my spouse. I could want the love of friends. I could want the acceptance of others. I could want success at work. I could want more money in my bank account. Like there's a lot we could want more of, but the song in this passage is describing the sufficiency of God's love for us. And if we, if we learn to trust in God's love this, through this union with Jesus, and I'm free from the fear of not getting everything I want from everybody else and other people and circumstances and situations, 
then I am free to love other people. And so uh, I don't have to relate to others in a selfish way trying to get what I need. So if, if I know I'm loved limitlessly and unconditionally by God, and you do a poor job of loving me on a particular day, I can be still free to love you because I'm trusting in God's love. So your imperfect love is not quite as offensive to me when I'm trusting in God's love. It still hurts to be loved imperfectly, but because God's love is sufficient, I can love the other imperfect people, you know, just like me, all around me. And what if, what if I'm not constantly striving for significance in the things that I can do and the things that I accomplish or the title I carry at work or how much money I can make because I'm, I'm resting in the sufficiency of God's love. So now, now I'm free. I have greater capacity to live in love with other people because I'm free from all of that. And so I, I don't have to constantly posture. I don't have to try to constantly impress people. I don't have to push somebody down so that I can push myself up because I'm free from that fear. I'm free to love others. I have a greater capacity. When God is healing my brokenness, when God is comforting me in my pain, then that pain and brokenness does not have to dictate how I relate to other human beings. So when I live connected to the vine, then I expand my capacity to love others. The deeper my connection with Jesus, the more fully God is meeting all of my needs in him, and the more free I am to live in love with others. This is why um, some of us might, might even be here today or at seasons in our lives when we're going through a really rough spot, maybe relationally or in our family or some rough spot in life, and we, we, go, we, we feel drawn to God, we trust that maybe God could do something to help. And that's 100% true, but maybe not in the way that we sometimes envision it working. I think sometimes we think, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to pray, and because I'm at church, God will be impressed and pleased by that. And then he'll answer my prayer to fix this person that make, is, is making my life hard, right? So it doesn't quite work that way usually. What works though is that when we, we feel drawn towards God, we're, we're right in that and there's solutions in him. But it's in being drawn deeper into intimate union with him. And God might answer a prayer, and God might intervene supernaturally in the life of somebody else, and God might change that person and set that person free, but it's in that union with Jesus that we are transformed, that we are set free, and that we are able in relationships with other people to relate differently because we're experiencing the sufficiency of God's grace and love in our lives. So if you're here today hoping that God will fix a relationship then the invitation would just be lean into him. Lean into him. Allow him to do something in you so that you are free to relate to and love other people differently. Union with him, deep connection with Jesus expands our capacity to love other people. Whether that's in, in loving kind of romantic relationships or friendships or relationships with coworkers or your difficult neighbor or your kids, expands our capacity to live in love. And that change in us then changes the way that other people experience God through us. It produces different kind of fruit. So I was talking with uh, a good friend of mine recently who works in construction. And uh, it was a very entertaining conversation. He was sharing with me about his coworkers' giftedness and how they have the gift, just an uncanny ability to use the F word for as a preposition and pronoun and adverb and object and every other part of speech, and then yet say absolutely nothing. Maybe you know some people like that. Maybe you are one. You're in the right church. It's good. Um, anyway, <laughs> so he works among a rough crowd is my point, all right? Works in a, wrong, a rough crowd. But my friend is also one of the most Jesus-like people I know. He is deeply connected to the vine, deeply connected. And so at his job, 
um, he's in a supervisory role. And uh, a lot of the other guys thinks he's, in his words, they keep, think he's a little bit of a nutcase because uh, he says things like, I'm not here just for the paycheck because he's not. And so, and they, they notice his different values and his different perspective and the way he interacts and the way he uses different words to complete sentences that make sense. And um, so they see that he's different, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. They look at him as a little bit of an oddball, but when he's dividing up guys into work crews, Guess whose crew all of these rough construction workers want to be a part of? His. And guess what these rough construction workers do when they're working with him and they have a moment of pause in their job? He's got these construction workers who are like bearing their souls to him and opening up to him. I wonder why. Maybe, maybe even rough construction workers are created for deep, life-giving connections with other human beings. And when they experience someone who, because he's connected to Jesus, has a greater capacity, unlike most of their coworkers who are busy writing poetry, uh, my friend has the capacity to listen, to care about, somebody just heard the poetry thing. It was like a, a slow joke, it took a second. He listens. And he cares about what's going on in their lives, and he's not trying to constantly impress others and and, and throw his power around, right? They're drawn to him, and they open up to him because his deep connection with Jesus gives him the capacity to love his coworkers. And his coworkers, even though they couldn't possibly name it in the same way, they're drawn to him because they long for deep life-giving connections. Some of you probably can observe the same dynamic in your workplace or in certain relationships where you feel drawn to someone or somebody feels drawn to you because this is how it works. Deep connection with Jesus expands our capacity for deeper connections with others and people are drawn to that kind of fruit in our lives. So when, when we experience that, It kind of raises the bar for us to understand our our place in the world, our sense of calling with others, right? That we're, we're God's plan A. My friend is living that out in a construction working environment. He recognizes that because he's connected to Jesus, that his relational connections with others might be the very means for them to encounter Jesus, They're they're much more likely to encounter it on a work site, on a break, talking to him than they are ever showing up in this building. And because of his connection with Jesus, he has the capacity to extend that kind of relationship to them. Now, for my friend at work, or for you and your family, or in your circle of friends, um, Putting ourselves out there to connect with others, um, it's always risky. And so Jesus speaks to that in this passage, right? There's no greater love than one who lays down his life for his friends. And Jesus says that before he would do that very thing, lay down his life. And so this deep connection with Jesus that expands our capacity to connect with others always comes at a price that's risky. Cost Jesus his life. And so when we extend ourselves in relationships with others, when we open ourselves up to be the means by which people get connected to the vine through our selfless love and relationship with them, we risk it. We risk being hurt. There's vulnerability in it. There's no way to to open ourselves up to these deep kind of connections that there there isn't pain. And so there's a cost. There's the cost of uh, risking vulnerability and then getting hurt and then having to forgive and experience God's healing, and then coming to that point where we decide, am I going to do it again? Am I going to let myself get hurt again? And maybe we say yes, and we risk, and some imperfect person hurts us again. We come back to Jesus. We seek healing and comfort and strength and grace and his love so that we can go back again and love. 
I just want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not speaking in like abusive type of relationships. This is just normal, imperfect people kind of stuff where we, we don't get the pleasure of offering deep, life-giving connections to people who are always perfect and always get it right. And, and, and kind of navigating that, the difference between just normal, imperfect relationship pain and abusive pain, that's something that you don't take lightly and you can, there's people that can walk with you in that. But I'm just talking imperfect people loving each other, right? And there's no way to do it without costliness, without sacrifice. And Jesus becomes our model for that. Our model, as uh, says in Hebrews 12, the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the one who goes first and shows us the way to go in loving others selflessly. And this is why, this is the heart of why the church is God's plan A. This is why the church is God's plan A to offer life, deep life-giving connections because it's not normal to choose the path of sacrifice in relationships with others. It's not normal to lay down my preferences and my needs and my wants in a relationship with another human being. It's not normal to be hurt by someone and to choose to forgive them and risk being hurt again. That's not normal in our world. What's normal, I can't tell you how many funerals I've done where people describe their loved one as um, they would have done anything for anybody that they loved or that their family was their world or they'd give you the shirt off their back. And that's true. Uh, and sometimes families are bold enough to even say, as long as you don't cross them. And that's the differentiating thing between Jesus followers and non-Jesus followers. Uh, lots of people can offer deep connections with people that are nice to them and treat them well and don't hurt them. But the church is different. We love people when, when they don't deserve it. We love people when it's not easy. We love one another when it requires risk and pain and challenges along the way. That, that's what sets the church apart. The church is a place where in our brokenness, in our brokenness, we're relying on Jesus to teach us how to love one another well. And we're willing to endure the pain of loving one another well, even when it's not easy. And you can't get that anywhere else. Because nobody else comes to Jesus on a cross and his grace and his forgiveness to sustain us in offering the same grace and forgiveness and love to other imperfect people. And so what, what does it look like to embrace that for you? Maybe one last question we might ask is, why in the world would we do that? Why would we endure the pain? Why would we take the risk of vulnerability? Why would we forgive and go around for round two? Why don't we just get rid of all the imperfect people in the room? And there'd be nobody left, so it'd be quiet here, but you know. Well, this passage, Jesus says a lot that I think reminds us why we take the risk, particularly in verse 11. He says this, my purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. Or in the NLT version, it says, so that your joy will overflow. That's why. That's why the church is God's plan A. That's why we choose to do this, because the fruit of deep and life-giving connections is overflowing joy. It's worth it. It's worth it. That's the bottom line. The, the depth of relationships we can experience in Jesus and with one another is one of the greatest gifts that God offers us. I love the way one of my favorite authors, Erwin McManus, says it. He says that your, your best future is waiting in your deepest relationships. Man, does that ring true? Think of some of your best moments in life. Not your future, but your past. And are not most of those best moments defined by the depth of relationship you shared with people in the midst of it? And if you can imagine your best future being all alone... <laughs> I can't even imagine it. Some of those that your best future is waiting in your deepest relationships. And the church is God's plan to invite us into 
those kind of deep relationships. Now, here, here's what I want to invite you to think about for a moment. Um, just, just in a self-reflective kind of moment of evaluation, if, uh, if this right here is relationships that are really shallow, uh, you know each other, you talk weather and sports and whatever, really shallow, and this end down here would be really deep, life-giving connections, you know, connected to the vine, and so we're more deeply connected to one another. Just in a moment of kind of self-reflection, can you name some relationships that land closer to this end for you? Would some of us need to maybe just be honest enough to say, my deepest relationships maybe are halfway there at best? And some of us maybe to say, I'm not even... My deepest relationships are still kind of toward this end. One of the, the telltale signs is sacrifice as you're kind of evaluating those relationships. Like where, where do I have relationships where people lay down their life for me and I lay down my life for others? There's a mutuality to it. And I'll just say this. If you, if you can name one relationship or three or four or five relationships to this end, like today, just take some time to thank Jesus for that. And, and recognize the gift that that is in your life. It's a gift that Jesus has given you. What I want to invite us all to consider is, um, are there relationships that, that I have now that I could invest in that would be moving this way? You've got some relationships that are solid, like middle of the ground, middle of the road, and with a little intentionality and investment, they could become relationships rooted in Jesus and defined by selfless love that would be life-giving on a whole new level if you poured into those relationships, right? Some of you might have to uh, find some different connections with people that are, because the, the thing that's keeping your relationships from having that kind of depth is that they're not rooted in Jesus. And um, there's just a different quality. My buddy whose birthday is today that I'll call later on. Um, there's a depth to our relationship, even though he lives in Canada and we don't get to see each other a few times a year probably. Um, th there's, there's, uh, it takes 0.5 seconds for us to pick up where we left off every time we talk. And there's nothing that's off limits in that relationship, right? And part of that continuity is the depth of our relationship with Jesus helps us maintain that, where we can be rooted in Jesus and so there's a continuity even though we might be separated by miles or time. So where are the relationships for you that you could lean into, recognizing that this is a gift that God has for you and that the church is God's design, his plan A for us to experience that, to lean into those relationships. The other piece that I wanna encourage you to think about is um, we are a people on mission to offer hope to the world. And part of the hope that we have to offer is deep life-giving connections. And so if you're somebody who can name a handful of relationships that lean this way, listen, you're abnormal in a beautifully grace-given kind of way. And there are other people who are desperate, and that is not too strong of a word, desperate to experience deep life-giving relationships that for you are normal. And I wonder how God would prompt us to take this gift that we have received and somehow extend it to others. It could look a million different ways, but if you have these relationships, there are people who are desperate for it. And how would God invite you to offer that gift to somebody in your circle of influence and, and be a part of others experiencing that gift as well? Here's what we're going to do as we conclude today. We're going to share in the sacrament of communion and allow some space for you to continue to pray and respond to Jesus. So we're going to do communion a little bit differently. And so we have stations here and uh, back there, I feel like an airline stewardess and there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm cracking myself up on that. <laughs> 
there are stations. And so there's uh, the juice and uh, cracker wafers in a cup. And um, we're going to just allow some space uh, as there's music playing for you to go and kind of circle up around those stations. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Kind of form a little circle around each of the stations. And uh, everybody get your communion elements. And then it's just take a moment and look each other in the eye. Just, just appreciate the people that you're standing there with. It might feel a little weird or awkward. It's all right. Just acknowledge that you're doing it, and then just receive the elements together. So the, the only rule is nobody goes alone. So we're going to do this in community. You can grab whatever community around you want. You could go with family. You could find your journey group in the room. If you see somebody sitting by themselves near you, invite them to come with you. Um, there's like 30 or so elements at uh, each spot, so we might have to spread around to make sure you get one where if you're going to take 15 of you. But just share in community and receive the gift of God's grace. So when we share in communion, uh, you don't have to be United Methodist. You don't have to be a member of this congregation to share in communion here. The one thing that we require is that you would want to draw near to God with a repentant heart. So you'd be humble enough to say, God, I don't, I don't have everything together. If there's sin in your life, that you would come confessing that, seeking God's grace and forgiveness. That you would come to communion just acknowledging your need for God's grace that was made available to us at a price. In communion, we acknowledge that Jesus sacrificed his life. He did what he told his disciples, that there's no greater love, no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus has shown us what this kind of depth of love looks like. So we receive the bread, a reminder of his broken body, and the juice, a reminder of his shed blood, that we might be one with him and one with one another in a way that no other organization in the world can offer because we are one in him. Jesus, we pray as we share in these moments of communion that we would experience your holy presence, that you would make this bread and juice for us be the very means of receiving your grace and love anew in our lives. For those who come with an awareness of sin that they need to confess, receiving forgiveness, God, I pray that they would have a certainty of your grace offered freely and at a cost of your life. For all of us, God, as we come to the table today, pray that we might continue to hear your spirit speak, your prompting, your invitation to experience new life in you, but also the gift of deeper life-giving connections with other people. God, give us grace and courage to take small next steps of obedience to connect with you and with one another. Pour out your spirit in these moments, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.